The following webinar provides general information through various speakers on a range of health topics only, for the educational and informational purposes as part of a general discussion on public health. The content does not include medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment or services to you or any other individual and is not a substitute for medical professional care. Do not use this information in place of a visit, consultation, or advice of your licensed healthcare provider. Never disregard medical or professional advice, or delays seeking it, because of something you hear or view on this lecture. Please ask your physician or other healthcare provider to assist in understanding any information that you may glean from this webinar or other services. Medical and health information changes constantly therefore, the information provided in this lecture should not be considered current, complete, or exhausted. Reliance on any information provided in this lecture is solely at your own risk. Donna Pinto was diagnosed with DCIS in 2010. Shock body aggressive standard of care treatment protocol. Donna said no to surgery, radiation, and tamoxifen and instead chose active surveillance, studied nutrition and followed a holistic lifestyle. Donna's extensive research culminated in the creation of two patient-centered websites, DCIS 411 and DCIS Redefined, Dilemmas, Choices, and Integrative Solutions. Both sites provide insights to the overdiagnosis and treatment controversies as well as current alternative resources for women with DCIS. Donna is also highly engaged in several online DCS groups. Donna will be sharing her knowledge of DCS with you. So now I'm gonna have Donna share her screen and hopefully we can all learn about DCIS. Okay, thank you so much, Jill. Um, it's kind of weird because I'm not seeing anyone now. I'm just seeing my screen. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just see your screen. Yes. Okay. okay. We're all new to this. And um, just want to say a big thank you to Jill for organizing this and all the uh, speakers with um, alternatives. I've been looking for alternatives from pretty much day one when I was given this DCIS diagnosis. It was in 2010, January, but it actually started a little bit before that. So I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of my story, and I do have some a few little graphic photos, but I feel it's important to show people and talk about, you know, what is happening still to this day, and it's, you know, even not even DCIS. So I'm going to um, start with how um, this all happened for me uh, when I was age 44. I was perfectly healthy, happy, fit two young kids, they were seven and nine. I mean, my life was wonderful. I was working for a nonprofit, doing the work I loved. Um, just went for a mammogram and um, calcifications. And that's pretty much how most of the women are being diagnosed with DCIS. Um, came to learn this after the fact. So this was all new to me. I was told I need a, um, a biopsy next step. And, you know, just like a dentist telling you, you need a um, root canal. I mean, I was just, compliant. I didn't look for anything. Um, I just didn't really ask the questions back then. Uh, I had the stereotactic core needle biopsy. The titanium chip was placed. I even looked back on my notes and it showed that they were going to put a marker in me, but I never did any research. I was just like, you know, with all the other instructions. Um, a week later, I was told over the phone, just as I was leaving my house to go do a presentation, um, I was told by a nurse, you have DCIS and you need a wide excision. Didn't know what DCIS was, never heard of it, never heard of a wide excision. And then a week later, I had the consultation with the surgeon and she says to me, no, it's, it's not DCIS. You have ADH, atypical ductal hyperplasia, but we need a larger sample of tissue to make sure no DCIS or invasive cancer is there. So you need to do a wide excision. I had no clue what this was. Again, did no research just said, could I wait a few months or two months till after the holidays? So we planned it for January and um, had no idea that this was really the exact same operation as a lumpectomy. I only learned this after the fact. So this is my graphic photo of what happened with the white excision biopsy is uh, the black and blue mark there 
is um, basically they put a wire through your breast, then they do a mammogram prior to surgery. I have up here, what's the harm? Um, and then they, this is to locate the area and then a mammogram is taken and it's, I thought this was absolutely barbaric and only by going through this did I know what it was. Um, so I think the bruising is the smashing from the mammogram, but this is basically what women go through that are having a lumpectomy and they, you know, often present it as a no big deal, you know, minimal, minimally invasive surgery. And I think it's highly invasive from my experience. And then here's a picture of what I look like right after the biopsy. This is just a wide excision biopsy. So um, it was just very deforming. Um, and, you know, my question is, was this necessary or could I have just monitored ADH at that time, which is, you know, what's being talked about with TCIS and active surveillance. So um, the results of that wide excision biopsy the next week was that I was upstaged to DCIS. That's how it was presented to me. It was 2.5 millimeters intermediate grade and there was a positive margin and just very matter of factly, the nurse said, and you can see there um, on the piece of paper, she drew out some pictures and wrote partial mastectomy plus radiation would give me a 10% recovery reduction or in recurrence risk at 10 years. And of course, you don't know any of these numbers or what this means when you're first given the diagnosis. It's just so overwhelming. Or versus a mastectomy, I could reduce my risk at 10 years to 2%. And, and uh, I just was, and the partial mastectomy would require seven weeks of daily radiation. Okay, this is just intermediate grade DCIS, which is low risk. Then I was given this pamphlet called A Women's Guide to Breast Cancer Diagnosis and Treatment. So now this is in 2010, but um, you know, I hear from women all the time and things are not much better um, across the country and even across the world. So my intuition kicked in right then when, that something's very, very wrong. The standard of care treatments, this fear-based risk communication was, you know, it just, I knew something wasn't right. This just did not um, it was like incongruent when you think about the, it was presented as a pre-cancer, not really cancer, but they're talking about a mastectomy or partial mastectomy and seven weeks of daily radiation. I thought they were out of their minds. So two days, so right, right away I go to the internet, of course, and uh, lo and behold, you know, my luck, two days later came this um, article, which is really the basis of why I created DCIS 411. It was an article in Medscape, take carcinoma out of DCIS and ease off treatment. And some of the key points that I highlighted here were um, statements by Dr. Laura Esserman at UCSF. And she's saying, basically, if it doesn't look like high grade DCIS, we should leave it alone. We would eliminate two thirds of all biopsies if we did. You know, she's saying there's now 60,000 new cases a year of DCIS in the United, United States, but we have not seen a drop in invasive cancers despite treatment of DCIS as if it were early cancer. And then she says minimal risk lesions should not be called cancer and only high grade DCIS is likely to progress to invasive breast cancer. So this totally was like resonated with me. And then it said, talked about DCIS as a possible candidate for management by active surveillance a treatment strategy of growing importance in prostate cancer in which low risk patients do not receive radiotherapy or surgery unless they progress to higher risk. So that totally resonated with me. I'm like, I, that's what I chose to do. I you know, just got really into diet, nutrition. Um, I studied nutrition. I actually became a, a, like a holistic nutritionist in this process, I just watched a lot of films and videos on alternative uh, cancer treatments through nutrition, lifestyle, um, and just put a lot of positive in. I really didn't go back to the doctors at all, um, but I did. They wanted me to have mammograms like every three or six months, and I was like, you know, made up my own schedule. I went at eight months, and then ten months after that. So, so then I have this situation. I'm, I'm about a year and a half later. I get a mammogram and it's like highly suspicious of, you know, malignancy. And then I asked for an MRI and it was also suspicious for malignancy. This is what's written down on the report, but they cannot tell if it's DCIS, even, you know, 
intermediate or low grade, or if it's invasive cancer that's like lethal, which is crazy to me with the imaging. So I'm told now I need a biopsy or surgery. So I grappled with that for a few months and I ended up saying, okay, just remove it. We know there's DCIS growing. I tried my hardest to do this holistic path. And, you know, in my mind, it, it didn't work, but here I had the surgery. I got the call. They said, no invasive cancer, Donna, but you got positive margin of DCIS and you need a second surgery. Okay. So now this is what happened after the second surgery. This is what my breast looked like. It was pretty awful. And this is when the surgeon tells me, uh, your breast is like spoiled soup. It's not worth saving and you need a mastectomy. So I'm still thinking this is crazy. I don't have invasive cancer. I got a second pathology opinion at that point, which told me that I had low grade DCIS, not even intermediate grade. So I, I just did a ton of research and, you know, just really followed a lot of the um, experts and doctors and people that had clout in the world of overdiagnosis and overtreatment was becoming the buzzwords. And I was reading all these books. As I said, I got the second pathology opinion. I also got a biomarker test at the time. It was Oncotype DCIS, uh, which showed that I was low risk for invasive cancer. So at that point, I was like, I am done. I said goodbye to the fear-based doctors and the over-treatment, and I feel like I was over-diagnosed. It's now been 10 years since I was told that my breast was like spoiled soup, and, I, and it wasn't worth saving, but I saved it. I haven't done a thing. Um, it's been all clear. I've been doing dedicated breast MRI the first four years because I did a lot of research on imaging. I realized that mammograms were not in my best interest. It's just, it was over-diagnosing me. It wasn't able to see the DCIS clearly because I kept getting these positive margins. And then I met a man named uh, Dr. Kevin Kelly in 2015, and he invented this automated whole breast ultrasound called Sonocine. And I've been, I live in San Diego. I've been driving up to um, Los Angeles to have that annual exam. And every year he tells me, there's nothing there. It's all clear. It's like, you know, you got nice pecs from, you know, doing um, weights and that's it. So I am very blessed. I just feel like um, I spend a lot of my time helping people paying it forward because I know what I went through and I know what every woman is going through that's still getting this diagnosis, either ADH or DCIS at this point. And um, I, I'm you know, I started it for support and the online groups and providing resources through my websites. And then also I created a nonprofit um, where I'm just focused on education and giving out scholarships through a nonprofit I call the Give Well Nets. And I, I would love to, you know, focus more on, on finding ways to help more women. And I, I'm really glad we're doing this because I think just coming together and hearing everybody's stories, um, I try to, the main thing I try to tell women is to slow down, um, get educated. There's lots of alternative resources and, and support for those resources outside the box. So I wanna thank everybody and I'm happy to take any questions and um, thank you to Jill for setting this up. Okay, so can you um, unshare your screen? Thank you. What I was gonna say to everyone, if. If you have a question that you want to ask Donna, on the bottom of your Zoom, you should have a, a reactions tab. And under the reactions tab, there's something called raise hand. And if you don't see that, then under the participants tab, it might say raise hand. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself so you can ask a question. Or if not, I mean, if anyone has a question, you could just unmute yourselves automatically and just ask it now. I guess we have no questions. I think Gwen is raising her hand. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. So, so I have a question. Uh, Chris, okay. So why don't, okay. Why don't Kristen go first? You can just, you know, unmute yourself and ask. Okay. 
Um, so Donna, thank you very much. Um, you actually have made all the difference in my journey here because I've been, I had pretty much a very similar story to you. I've had like two excisional biopsies slash lumpectomies or whatever. Um, so I saw, you know, and, you know, I've been following, you know, along on your site or whatever. And, and um, so I was curious, you know, I know you mentioned um, that the, uh, the dedicated breast MRI, that, is that just like a regular MRI or is that something different? I'm sorry, that's a dumb question. No, it's actually a really good question because I, I struggled with that in the beginning and we don't even have one in all of San Diego, a big city like San Diego basically means that you're going to a center that just does breast MRI. They're not changing out the coil for other body parts. So like I go up to Irvine or I used to go, I don't do this anymore, but um, that that MRI machine is solely for the breast. That's what that means. And oh, okay. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, have a lot of um, information about that, the dedicated, it used to be called Rodeo MRI. That was the, the name of the software. Um, but I, on the DCI's redefined website, there's a whole section on MRI and it kind of explains that. And do you know, are there areas now, outside? Now, better than that, they have something called a fast or abbreviated MRI. And I would look for that because it's just less time. And um, if you're going to do an MRI and also start asking about, you know, could you do an MRI without the contrast dye? Because that's also not good for our health. But that's why yeah, I've, actually, I've switched to the automated ultrasound. There are different brands of the automated ultrasound. The Sonocine happens to be the one that I've done with Dr. Kelly, but it's not readily available. It's like, it's frustrating because the, there are things in existence, just like cryoblation you're gonna hear about, but it's not readily available. You may have to fly across country and you know, it's just the nature of the, where it's at right now. And um, you know, and the, the mammograms are still pushed. They can't even say it's a alternative to mammogram. They have to say it's a supplement because it's that's the only way they get FDA approval. There's a lot of reasons why things are being said. Thank you, Donna. I'm definitely going to look into that because they, they want me to get an MRI next month. So I, I'll look. I'll definitely look into that. Yeah, and you can also email me if you have any further questions or need help. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so th thank you for the question. Kendra, would you unmute yourself and ask your question or questions? There, does that work? Yes. I'm kind of new to these Zoom things. Yes. Okay, so I have, I have a little bit of a different situation. I've had a lump for a couple of years and I've been having thermography scans done on it and it's been stable, even though the actual lump has been growing. And so the, the functional medicine doctor that I've been going to, he said, he wonders if it's some kind of calcification, but because there's something showing like the, the thermography has changed a little this time, he, he says, he thinks I should maybe have something else done. And I'm at the point of saying, what should I do? Do I go to get an ultrasound? Do I get blood work? Like, where do I go from here without having to go the medical route? Yeah, well, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, thermography, I also have some information. I did a lot of research on that as well. And that's not really ex uh, something that any of the, you know, doctors, I see Dr. Holmes is on here, that oh, um, they, they have any um, experience looking at. So I remember talking with Dr. Esserman about that. And she said her sister was a radiologist and it's been proven, you know, not to show cancer and it will show inflammation and other possible issues. But I did a couple of thermograms, it didn't show anything and I had low grade DCIS. So to me, it was kind of like confirming that's not really cancer, it doesn't have a blood supply. So- And yeah, this um, one doesn't show any kind of blood supply to it at all. Yeah, I've heard that people have can uh, invasive cancer and it doesn't show up on thermography. So I wouldn't rely just on that. I would, I would seek right. out- Right, that's why I'm trying to figure out where yeah. the next step. Yeah, I would seek out the, so, like, that's what I do, the automated ultrasound, because I have dense breast tissue. The that's what I have too. Tumor. So I'm like, okay, it, you know, you, you want to find invasive cancer early, not ADH or DCIS. In my opinion, that's kind of what I realized. I have, you know, I was only 44, so I have like a long way to go. I don't, I didn't want to have, you know, so much radiation. There's all these complications with. Right. Radiation. And that's kind of what I've been advocating for and, and it's really challenging because um, 
you know, I think the MRI is good, but it's then you got the contrast dye. So you got to weigh the pros and cons and maybe you do it alternating with like one, you know, one year, one the next year, something like that, whatever you, you feel is works for you. I, I know. For so will that, will the ultrasound, will the ultrasound show up enough information for me to have an idea of what's going or for them to have an idea of what's going on? So I, I would say go to see Dr. Kevin Kelly in Pasadena because he he's like a 35 year expert radiologist. This important thing is to be with someone who can read these things and look and, and he's like on a hunt, a detective for invasive cancer and yeah, the tiniest invasive, like I trust him. Like it's important to have a trust in a doctor that's going to sit down with you and explain things to you. And oftentimes the radiologist is not someone we interact with. So um, yeah, Central yeah. Illinois is not the best place to live to get some of that stuff. <laughs> right. Well, you know, yeah, we're always a good place to have a vacation too, and then you can also have a, a consultation <laughs> with Dr. Holmes. At the same time, that's what I tell people, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. And getting more information on the um, the the biopsy sample, like the biomarkers of whether it's DCIS or cancer. There's different tests now, the Decision RT or the Mammoprint. So you're getting information that's going to help you make decisions. What was the first one you said? I've heard of the mamma print. It's decision RT. That's just for DCIS. It's with um, Prelude. Oh, okay. So. And are those things that you need to see, or, like a regular doctor has to prescribe, or is that something that you would go get your, yeah. like no, have you, done yourself? You do need a doctor to order that for you, but if you have trouble with a doctor that doesn't know about it or won't order it, you can call the company and see okay. if they have a doctor they can refer. I have to. a I have a functional med I have a functional medicine slash MD that I've been working with the last year that I found, and I'm going to her next week, and I'm going to see what she's willing to order for me and what she's not, just as a start yeah. to see where to go from there. Yeah, there's. Yeah, and then there's, you know, putting out there on the support groups, who who knows a doctor that would, would order right. test or whatever, you know, that's how you find resources. Yeah. Okay. I actually just got on the group yesterday, so Great. it's all, I'm I'm trying to get adjusted on here. Great. And do you think there's blood work that is helpful to have done or not? Like I've heard, I mean, in what I've read, a lot of reading there yeah. they've given me different blood work that can be done someone else um, might be better at answering there's so that. much of it out there yeah someone else might be better at answering that I mean I'm only dealing with DCIS okay. there's not really any blood tests right. they, you know functional doctors are different they're looking at different things they're looking at inflammation which is a really good thing mm -hmm. you want to reduce your inflammation no matter what so if you right. follow those protocols and look at your blood and see your your overall health that's going to definitely help but mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the blood okay. test cancer. Well, the one thing I just want to interrupt, the one thing I will say about the blood test, there are different blood tests out there, but the cheapest one out there, which most insurance companies cover, it's called CA27-29. Or there's mm -hmm. also the CA125. The 27-29 is for breast cancer. The CA125 is for ovarian cancer. But I, I actually call them the bullshit test. And the reason I they say don't. that, because I get it done, it doesn't work. What it winds up being is they took um, blood readings, and I, don't, I forgot what they were looking for, but out of like 10,000 women, they took blood readings of women that they know do not have cancer. And then they took 10,000 women that they know do have cancer. And they look to see what the difference was. And so um, there's some cancer biomarker, like if, if you have zero to 30, when if your test results come back zero to 36, that means that your blood is normal. Anything above 36 means that you have a high possibility of having cancer. With that being said, I had breast cancer twice my biomarkers for that test came out in a normal range. And yeah, and that's what I've heard. It's not very reliable. It's not reliable at all. Mm -hmm. I have to go by that only because I don't have very good insurance. 
and the better tests are like seven thousand dollars i can't afford that so i go mm. with this 30 dollar test yes. does it really help me yeah no, some people swear by the rgcc test the greek test in some correct areas. Mm. i've heard of that one too right that is supposed to be the better one um and then there was another one i forgot the name of it simplicity i'll have to put it in, in the um in my group um yeah. they also do something like our you know ccg the only problem is it's two thousand five hundred dollars for the test like, um I, I went to take the the webinar and i had to leave a number so the guy calls me oh you're gonna get it done and when he says 2500 i said no i mean you know you listen it would help me don't get me wrong to make better decisions but at that amount of money my insurance companies are paying for it i can't afford it so kendra this is Kwana. Yeah. i will say that um the two tests that my physician my oncologist ordered for me that i'm doing right now um, is the BioCEP test and the Keras test. Um, those are two blood tests that you can you can look into um, and you know ask your and they are covered by insurance usually. Um, so I just okay. came up a couple weeks ago and I'm waiting for my results. But they sent me the kit to my home and I just took it into the flea bottomist and they um, ran that blood test and then I sent it back in. So I'm waiting for that information to come back. Do you, how are those spelled? Yeah, could you tell us those tests? I, I think I just put them, um, and it might have just went past, but I'll, I'll put them back in the chat. OK. I've just done enough reading to know I don't want to go the regular medical route, and it's trying to figure out what's the best way to proceed from where I'm at. <laughs> so thank you for your help. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. That was fantastic. And thank you for all the answers. I'm happy that we're learning. Okay. Uh, yes. Judy, would you like to unmute yourself and speak? If you yes. have a question to yeah. ask, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I first I wanted to say thank you to Donna. I mean, I've been on this journey since 2014 and uh, Donna and I have never, I, I don't think ever talked in person, but okay. so I knew Donna's whole story and I've, yeah. I had a DCIS story too before I had my cryo story, but uh, I was being monitored active surveillance at UCSF for almost four years and they were watching it. And of course, every MRI is like, well, we really can't tell, let's do a biopsy. And I wouldn't have a breast if we did every biopsy that they wanted to do. Um, and I was doing thermograms, so that's why I kind of wanted to chime in. I was doing thermograms and I started, thanks to Donna, I started going to see Dr. Kevin Kelly. And um, he's fabulous and I love the man. And even when my thermogram, because I was doing thermograms every six months just to stay on top of it, never showed anything. But even when I had a thermogram that was clean, that's when Dr. Kelly found the invasive cancer. And that is what led me to Dr. Holmes. But so, you know, I, I was doing thermograms. I had done MRIs, but I really think mm -hmm. the, the uh, ultrasounds for if you have a small, dense breast and you really want to find out what's going on, for me, that was, you know, what worked. So, yeah. great story. Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And thank you for always sharing in the groups and you know, referring people to Dr. Kelly and Dr. Holmes and, you know, just you're a really good voice out there that, that helps a lot of women. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Indra, please unmute yourself and ask away. Hello, everyone. Hi, um, so my story is a little complicated. Um, so my mammogram, <clears throat> sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm 42 years old. No, oh, no, no, no. I'm not 42 years old. I'm 44 years old. I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, so I, my mammogram was put off um, due to COVID. So I hadn't had a mammogram um, for about 18 months. And then when all the restrictions were lifted, I just went in to have my routine, um, everything prior to last year, August. Um, I started having mammograms at 40 and then everything from that point onwards was fine. And then I went in and had this mammogram last August and they saw some calcifications 
and um, they said that the chances are that it was probably nothing because 80% of what they see is nothing. Um, and I unfortunately fell into the 20% and I ended up having a biopsy done. And that came back as DCIS. And at the time I didn't know anything about what they were telling me. And um, it was, um, we need to have you um, see a breast surgeon to talk about having a lumpectomy done. They said the area was very small on the mammogram. Um, so I did proceed with the lumpectomy um, under the assumption that everything that was showing up was a small area. And um, I went ahead and had this lumpectomy done and I didn't get clear margins the whole way round. And they said that the next um, option for me was to have another re-excision or a mastectomy. Now, the thought of a mastectomy just terrified me actually so I said well we'll we'll proceed with the lumpectomy again and I um I did have it again I had another lumpectomy and the margins were not clear again and so um went back in to see the surgeon and the only thing that was on the table for me was a mastectomy and um due to fear and my situation is somewhat complex in, in that I'm already in treatment for cancer, for a um, sarcoma. Um, I didn't want to risk anything. So I went ahead and had this mastectomy done in January because I was just so scared of what they were telling me. And um, I just can't risk something else happening when I'm in treatment for a cancer at the moment. And so um, I have my reconstruct, my final surgery in um in may at um, the end of this month actually and i'm just terrified really of what this all could mean potentially for me down the road um i don't have any um genes um breast cancer doesn't run in my family so i don't even know how this even happened um i can only really put it down to perhaps all the stress i've been under since i was diagnosed with the sarcoma and um, I'm on a treatment that can actually cause a lot of inflammation in the body and my my oncologist doesn't really have any answers for me as to what potentially caused this DCIS nobody really has any answers and um do you know so I'm do, do you know what grade it was did they tell you the so grade? this is so this is the thing too so when I had the biopsy done it was between a two and a three then I had the two lumpectomies done at um, one hospital here in Virginia and they it came back as a grade two then I had the mastectomy done at another hospital because that's where the plastic surgeon was and it came back as high grade so everything is just well that's there's that's, no consistency there yeah. really and I well that, that's a known problem with the pathology that's why I urge everyone to get a second pathology opinion as well as the biomarker test so that they don't just go forward without the knowledge of certainty. And you know what, you, you only know what you know. So you have to be gentle and kind to yourself with what you've been through. Right. And just, yeah, I mean, do you have a specific question? So I guess for me, I mean, just the inconsistencies with all the pathologies, um, that was a big red flag for me. Um, because I really don't know how to, yeah. how to, I mean, all, all I can do myself is everything, you know, in terms of dieting and all those things, you know, that's the most that I can do, but I feel somewhat powerless really, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm between a rock and a hard place here. I mean, I'm already in treatment for one thing. And then this shows up whilst I'm still in treatment and I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I go on this. The survival for DCIS is like, you know, 99%, you know, it's not like you shouldn't, you don't need to be terrified because you've done excessive, a lot of treatment. And right. And I also, um, it wasn't nipple. It, um, so I lost my nipple in the process of having the mastectomy too, um, because um, 
the two lump the last lumpectomy that I had, they said that the margins were very close to my nipple. And um, they said we could leave the nipple and then we could, if it comes back that the margins are not clear, we can go back and take take it off. And I at that point, I mean I by the time I had the mastectomy, I was at my ninth surgery just with everything that I've endured with all the other the other diagnosis. And I said, no, let's just remove it because I'm not going to come back in and risk a chance of an infection. And so sorry. Yeah. I mean, I just it's just been um, the time because I know there's other speakers that want to talk. So I, I know right. I'm so sorry. It breaks my no. heart. But I think we need like a second um, <laughs> one of these so that we, we can all kind of share stories. And I know no, that's. We're going to have a, a, we're going to do this again with people yeah. sharing stories. Yeah. Thank I, you for sharing I that, Indra. It's important. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can say really is that it's just unfortunate that I saw everyone's stories after the fact. Because my head was just such in a spin. I just That's needed to just take action. And now here I am. So yeah, I feel bad, Indra. A lot of us have just taken action. I mean, when you hear cancer, cancer is a scary word. And then you just start hearing the statistics of survival rates versus, um, you know, hearing the triumphant stories. It makes it very difficult. So um, don't feel like you've made a mistake. You made the best choice you could at that time yeah. and um so I think she put in there a link to all of us I'd like to talk to you Andrew Andrew I'm a cancer coach um and I'd like to talk to you because I do know another African-American woman who is a pathologist who has mm -hmm. an app in which you can load your pathology reports to her and she will read them for you her name is Dr. Keisha Okay. Um, I just pinged her um on Instagram I'd like to connect you with her um, she's amazing. So I just wanted to be able to be a resource to you. So um, reach out to me on that link and I will help you as much as I can. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I just want to let everyone know again in the chat, I have a Microsoft Word file that you can download. It has all the links to everyone that's speaking tonight. Um, links on how to contact them through Facebook, through their websites. I also have links if you need to contact Dr. Williams, who does cryoablation. Also, Dr. Holmes, who does cryoablation. If you need to contact any of them, their information is in that packet that you can download. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Michelle, you have a hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for organizing this. My question is, um, uh, has anybody had, ha um, I, I have the PALB2 gene mutation. So um, I guess my question is, you know, my, my doctors have said that I'm not a candidate for cryoablation or even active surveillance because of the gene mutation that I have and also the family history of my mom and my aunt having had breast cancer. So I wanted to see what everybody's experience is like regarding that. Um, I, we can't answer that because we're not really doctors, but we do have Dr. Holmes. Okay. <laughs> if he would like to answer that, I would be so grateful. And he's a cryo doctor. So you'll be talking to him. If you need to get cryoablation done, Dennis Holmes. Great. I can't say anything more about him. He's a fantastic doctor. Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> uh, can you see Hi, me? Hi, Dr. Holmes. Yes. 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 Can see you. Well, I'll, I'll give you the, the simplified answer to the question, which is that I think they're recommending that you opt for something more extensive in the, than corroboration, like mastectomy, because they're concerned about your risk of recurrence. The probably two mutation increases your lifetime risk of breast cancer. It's a high risk gene. And so there's a risk for cancer in both breasts that's high enough to make an argument in favor of mastectomy. If you are open to pursuing mastectomy, then that would be the most definitive treatment. But if you're from, if you have the perspective that mastectomy is something that you would not like to do, you would simply opt to have surveillance instead of mastectomy. You can undergo any procedure, whether it's lumpectomy or cryoblation, to deal with the pressing problem, which is the cancer that is presently in your breast, and then defer the decision about mastectomy to a later date. 
I'm not saying that prior ablation will solve the problem of recurrence in the same breast and opposite breast, but prior ablation as just like lumpectomy can at least address the cancer that's currently growing, if that's the case, uh, so that it doesn't become a source for lymph node spread or spread to another part of the body. So sometimes patients feel like they're not prepared to make all those decisions at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. In some way, you can sort of make part of this treatment decision by at least dealing with the most life-threatening problem up front. And then since the risk of a pelvic mutation spans years or decades, you can decide at a later point, later in a year, next year, two years from now, that you'd like to take on the global breast risk in a different way. In the meantime, if that's the decision you make, I'd say you should continue to be screened closely so that if something new develops, it can be found soon. And of course, uh, there are risk reduction things that can be done as well to lower your risk as much as possible. And when you say continue to screen, so is that every six months or every year for the MAMO and MRI and ultrasound? Uh, for this diagnosis, I would recommend alternating at six month intervals mammography and breast MRI so that you have examination and breast imaging twice a year with two different modalities, MRI being the most sensitive for high risk patients, which would be a pelvic tube mutation, which would include a pelvic tube mutation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for answering. That was, yeah, well, he's a doctor, he should know. <laughs> so like I said, if anyone's thinking about cryoablation and we have um, Sharon going to speak about it, and she's a patient of Dr. Holmes, then he's the guy to ask. He's the guy to send all your scans to. He knows everything about it. Okay, up next we have Gloria. So Gloria, do you want to um, unmute yourself, please? Yeah, hi, it's so hi. good. To hi, it's great to have, thank you so much, Jill, for hosting this and- um, Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate everybody here. I I just had a quick question. I put it in the chat, but you know, I had done a couple of MRIs. I had a mastectomy. So Indra, I did do that for a DCIS diagnosis. They told me they found two millimeters of IDC, but ironically it was like right exactly at the spots where like a very brutal biopsy had happened. Yeah. Um, I always wondered about that. Anyway, I did it. And then I, uh, I had a couple of follow-up MRIs with contrast, which I think I reacted to. Um, but I do have a question about like, just how do you, do you, like, how do you ask your doctor to get you to refer that, you know, Donna, how do you get the MRIs to continue? Because my, I do have an oncologist I see once a year now, but he's like a little reluctant to, uh, you know, yeah. refer me in. Well, that's a good question. My, my doctor, my surgeon, I remember she said to me, you'll get an MRI um, approved by insurance once. But if you don't do the mammogram, they won't approve it. But I proved her wrong because I, you know, I guess I have pretty good insurance. I have a PPO, but I okay. was able to get um, insurance covered it for four years. And I think my primary care is just to ordered it from then on because I really didn't okay. go back to um, oncologists or surgeons at that point, but I did go back to the, in, within the same institution, the, um, my primary care who was, just wonderful. She just ordered what I wanted. She just said, I got to tell you, you know, you need, you're due for your mammogram. I said, I know and so, <laughs> they have to tell you that, but I would ask her yeah. to order, but you know, with like automated ultrasound, you don't even need an order. You can go directly to, um, Dr. Kelly. Um, you probably could do that with MRI also. It just depends on your insurance. So just don't believe yeah. everything the yeah. doctor okay. tells you. Sorry, Dr. Holmes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, you just keep, keep pushing, pushing. It's going to take women to make the changes, right? That's remember Dr. Esserman said that long ago. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna see. okay. Great. Um, I put a Q, there's a QT scan, scan I did too. I've been experimenting, and I saw Dr. Kelly a couple of years okay. ago, and then last year in Nevada, in November in Nevada, I went to get a, a QT scan. So I'll put the yeah. link to that if people oh, are interested. Good. That's like an right. ultrasound, but it's in a tub of, it's in a tub of water. Yes. It's yes. kind of fun. Dr. I Susan about was that. talking about that for years and I did contact them. That wasn't readily available either about a year or two ago. So 
if you could share that information, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, they've been on and off. They they had they they paused for a while and then yeah. they're back up again. So okay, good, awesome. All right, thank you. All right, Duana, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Oh, Duana, you have a question. Duana, yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm having to call in from a phone. I don't have a microphone on my computer. So okay. thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for this. This is really perfect timing uh, for me. I do have a couple of rather, um, I don't know, uh, maybe not very intelligent questions, but um, my quickly, my situation is I was diagnosed with DCIS. I have two areas in one breast, so of course, the recommendation was mastectomy, and it sounds like most of you, it was all rushed very quickly. Fortunately, I got my wits about me um, within a couple of days and canceled all appointments. I've been doing active surveillance since 2016, and my last thermogram did show an increase in temperature, so it was suggested that I have um, an ultrasound which I did, which then said you need a mammogram, right? So it's just a constant circle. Um, and I had really held off on mammograms since 2016. But in my area, we don't have a lot of um, testing available without going through traditional paths. And I did find um, someone who um, was willing to talk with me. I did consent to a mammogram, and then I did an MRI. So what the result is, is that one of the areas in the breast is now 5.2 centimeters. Um, so of course, you know, there's pressure for a mastectomy. Um, lumpectomy is not an option for me for two spots. I'm not gonna do a mastectomy. Um, so here's my question. I have a couple of questions. For those of you that have um, DCIS and you've not done surgery, uh, you've had lifestyle changes in those things, is, have you seen a reduction in your area of DCIS or does that even happen or does it just stop growing? So like, can it actually reduce in size or does it just stop growing? Has anybody ever heard of why we get DCIS, right? So what am I doing in my life that is making more, me more susceptible to it as well? And then my third question, and then um, I'll stop and let you answer. Um, so I've been doing active surveillance since 2016. There is further growth. It's not invasive. Every test you know, pretty much that can be done has, including blood work. Um, at what point, do you actually take action um, other than surveillance? So in other words, since I know I've had growth since um, 2016, I don't know what the size was, they didn't measure, there was no measurement, um, but we know that it's grown. My next step would be to, to try cryoablation um, if I would qualify for that. But you know, at, at what point do you kind of say, okay, let me go ahead and kind of nip this thing in the bud so that it doesn't continue to grow, or potentially, if I, you know, be this twenty-five percent, that it would become invasive. Well, and, uh, yeah. there's a few women in that situation. I would say go to see Dr. Holmes. Holmes, <laughs> I was going right? to say that too. We do. We uh, Dr. Holmes does these webinars once a month. Which at the end of this webinar, I'm going to put his information on there. But the last webinar Dr. Holmes did, he had um he had some video of him doing cryoablation on a huge tumor it took up almost three quarters of the woman's breast wow. and because when you think of cryoablation which in my talk i'll be talking about it the the cryo ball that gets produced from the nitrogen is 1.5 centimeters it's i'm not going to say it's small but it's not big either Obviously, when someone has a bigger tumor, what they can do is cryoablate certain areas, making sure that the cryoablation overlaps so all the tumor gets frozen. And I do know for a fact that Dr. Holmes does that. So you can send your information to him, like send him your scans and all your reports, and he'll make the determination if, you know, if you're a candidate. But 
Okay. Um, as far as lifestyle changes, you know, like I said, every tomb is different. Like I know for me, I've had breast cancer a couple of times and it's not genetic. I think, you know, it has a lot. Yes, I made some lifestyle changes. I cut out some foods that you're not supposed to be eating, but I also think it's where I live. I live in a town that has a town dump or used to. So it could be toxic where you're living, what you're breathing. So it's, it's up to you the way you want to handle, you know, your tumor. But if you did want to go the route of cryoablation, I know that's an option. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And so why would we all like to know what, why, why this happened to us? I have multifocal as well. And I asked right. my doctor, you know, why I'm right. like, you know, I get a mammogram every freaking year. And then one year I get it and I have like three spots of DCIS out of it, you know? And I was like, how can that happen? He wasn't able to explain it at all. He thought, he said it might've been some congenital abnormality was all he could even come up with. So, and this was like a high, you know, like the head of surgery at Hopkins. So yeah. I'm like, he wasn't really able to give it. I mean, I think that's what we would all love to know because we would all stop doing whatever it is. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I just want to <laughs> say, you have to remember also, there's a lot of research out there talking about overdiagnosis of DCIS yep. because if you look at the charts, there's like a 500% increase with the invasive cancers have remained the same. So maybe it's not as big of a thing as we're, you know, we're all thinking, how did I do this? What did I do? Da, da, da. But I went into the mindset of that I'm perfectly healthy and I, I've been overdiagnosed. And yeah. so that's probably the case for 75%. And then there's another 25% who are more likely to become invasive cancer and maybe need to do something quicker. Um, but I think it's a mindset also. Like I was, I was- yeah vegan practically or vegetarian. And I, I had a great diet and all through this and it still grew, but also if you're cutting through something or, you know, or getting biopsies, maybe that's triggering things too. Like there's, there's a lot of unknowns about it, but I wouldn't, you know, beat yourself up about what you're doing diet wise and lifestyle wise, because there's many, many people that are super healthy that have. Yeah. So I would say, you know, work on your stress and getting rid of the toxic people in your life. And whenever I drill down with people, it's like, oh, it's really like, what kind of stress are you going through? And I think that's, that's one of the more, mm -hmm. more I went through a lot of stress when my, the year and a half that it grew, I had a tremendous stress in my life that was like, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. It was a family member and um, going through a crisis. So I do think that stress plays a critical role and that we we have to be not blaming ourselves for not being so perfect. Um, uh, this is Dennis Holmes. May I make a, may I add a comment to this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to understand that the process of carcinogenesis, as we call it, the development of cancer, uh, spans a long period of time. That if you're diagnosed with DCS today, it's likely the result of a process that started 10, 20, 30 years ago, maybe even in your teens as your breasts were developing. It, there was something that went, around, that went awry in the development of a, of, a, of a particular duct that set in path this event. And, and the pace at which it goes partly depends upon the biology of that defect, but also the environment in which it develops your breasts, your lifestyle, your stressors. And so one of the factors that can affect, you know, how cancer grows is those are the things that were just discussed, but it didn't start when that stressful event happened. The stressful event happened might've, the stressful event that happened might've enabled a process that was already on the way to move more swiftly. Conversely, by controlling the environment, you can potentially slow a process that otherwise would move more swiftly. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was a great answer. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to yeah, ask? Yes, I would like to answer Duana's question okay. about can DCIS under active surveillance reduce? And it can. Um, I was enrolled in the comment study uh, 13 months ago. So I've had two follow-up mammograms. And at the first one, they came back and asked if I had lost weight. And I said, no. 
and my calcifications had shrunk from four centimeters to two and a half. If your body can accept it, I believe that 20 milligrams of tamoxifen had a huge effect. It does give you more signs of or symptoms of menopause than I would like to have experienced, but I think it had a huge impact. And now I'm on 10 milligrams and the doctors are accepting of that and it, it continued to not grow. So yes, it can. So I hope that if you are, have the opportunity to read about the comet study, please do so. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, there's also a study by Dr. Shelley Wong um, using endocrine therapy and showing mm -hmm. with MRI reduction. That was a couple of years ago. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was great. In fact, yeah, I've done some reading on the comet study. I wasn't, I didn't know about it when I first got diagnosed with DCS. Had I realized that I would have done that instead. Well, I was told that it was full right. uh, 13 months ago, but at my last oh. visit a few weeks ago, there are openings, although oh, they okay. have modified the criteria okay. for joining it. I don't know who told you that information. I'm actually a patient advocate on the Comet study, and they're actively recruiting all across the country right now. Oh, wow. And um, there's a new website coming out probably in, a, in about three weeks that we've worked on. It's called CometStudy.org. So the DCIS options is going to it's going to go down for a little bit, but then it'll come back. There's going to be a decision tool um, on there and some other general information. But there's a lot of good information with the Comet study. And if anyone's interested, that it's definitely still recruiting. Excellent. Do you need a doctor to refer you to the study? You need a doctor that is participating in the study. So, if, you know, you have you can look on clinicaltrials.gov and it gives all the locations. I mean, I was on a call today, Yale University just joined, and, you know, this late in the game, we're like four years into it. So oh, they're wow. still recruiting. Uh, there's almost 700 women in the study now. And thank you for being in the study. So it's- I did half of my visits virtually too. I worked through all of my second opinion with the Mayo Clinic, and I've never been to Rochester, Minnesota yet for that reason. Well, that's great. Oh. Yeah, Donna, I know for the comics, like, don't you have to be, I know I had tried to get in it, but they said I had, you know, since it was since November that I, I guess I, I didn't meet the criteria for getting into it because I had been diagnosed too far out or whatever. It's 120 days. Yeah. We pushed, we pushed for it. The patient advocates pushed for it to be longer. It was going to be 90 days. So, so that was one of the things, but yeah, if, yeah, they would make you do another biopsy in order to qualify. Mm. Who wants to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you also have to be willing to be randomized. That is the, the yeah. critical part of the comet study right now. You can't just say, oh, I, I really want active surveillance, so I want to be in the comet study. That's like the main change. So, but I know Dr. Esserman's doing her own registry of active surveillance at UCSF. So and you can do video visits. I have a, a, a friend. Um, from Florida, who's working with UCSF. And uh, one of uh, Laura Esserman's colleagues, Dr. Michael Al Alvarado, she speaks highly of him. Well, that, that's really good to know. I wish more people could get into the Comet study. Like I said, I didn't know about it when I had my DCIS, but I know about it now. So I you know, tell other people about it. Does anyone else have another question? I just have a question. Pardon Check me, ahead. Phil. I can't find the, the hand raise in my like screen here. And I'm on these calls like every single you, day. That's but okay. You know what? I apologize. Don't worry about it. I actually just filled out. Well, I was asked to be in the comment study through Dana Farber, but the randomization has kept me from really making the final decision. And I've spoken to Donna before about it. But I'm curious, Donna, you said that Dr. Laura Esserman is doing her own sort of thing where you can do active surveillance, um, but you don't have to be in the, because the comment study is randomized. And so the chances are, so I was going to send, I literally filled out the stuff, I was going to mail it, it's, it's in my mailbox to go out. And I thought, well, if they ask me to do surgery, I'll probably say no, because I don't, I don't want to, you know, basically. But yeah. can, would, who would, would Laura Esterman do, do um, active yeah. surveillance? 
yeah, she'll, she, you can even email her. She'll, she'll email you back. She's pretty good about that. And just, or just call UCSF, make an appointment, see who's available. You know, I know she's got like a registry of like over a hundred patients following. She's just a rebel. She's like, I was like, why would she not join the Comet study? You know, she's been pushing for this all these years. And, and it's just fascinating to me how politics in medicine works, right? You know, crazy, but they used to, Shelley, yeah, Dr. Shelley Wong and used to work with Laura Esterman. And I'm like, why are you not, why, why are you guys not like working together still? They like, everything, not everything goes quiet. <laughs> no, Dana Farber hasn't been very nice to me. I went to Dana Farber Mass General because I'm from Boston. And then I went to Cancer Treatment Center of America. Um, and they were very honest. They said, you don't have cancer. It's pre, it's pre cancer. They were straightforward and honest, but they said, we have no options, but standard of care. The best thing they could say is you can do surgery. Um, and I have, um, you know, I took all the genetic tests and I'm also older than all of you. I'm 67. So my insurance is Medicare. They pretty much pay for everything. And I have a super incredible supplement. So, and I own an insurance agency. So if they say no, I know how to get them to say yes. But, um, you know, I, anyway, I don't, I just wanted to know, maybe she'll do active surveillance. They're not going to do it at Dana-Farber and Mass General, basically. They don't want to even have anything to do with me at this point. So yeah. UCSF is your, your place for that. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, Does anyone have another question? question? Okay, well, if not, I'm going to really, I have to thank Donna and give her a big hand because she really knows her stuff on DCIS. And she's been, she's been a big help to me at least because she already had a DCIS um, Facebook group on, you know, on Facebook when I started mine. And I asked her to help me out with mine and she was so nice in saying yes. And the reason why I started my group was I wanted more women to know that DCIS doesn't always equal surgery. You know, like nine times out of 10 in all these groups on Facebook, I'm seeing people have DCIS stage zero and they're getting a mastectomy because their doctor said they needed one. And I'm like, what? I, I didn't get it. So that's why I'm happy that we're having this webinar so people can know about the Comet trial. People know that DCIS doesn't require surgery. You could sit and wait. You don't have to rush right away like I did because I was you know, nervous uh, about, you know, when you're told you have cancer, you think you're dying tomorrow. People need to know that DCIS, no, you're not dying tomorrow. You have time to wait. With that, I'd like to um, introduce you to Sharon Merritt. Let me read you her qualifications. She's a current cryoablation patient and patient ag advocate of Dr. Dennis Holmes. Sharon started the Facebook group Paget's Disease of the Breast. Dr. Holmes' passion for his patients inspired Sharon to start advocating for cryoablation and helping other ladies find less invasive holistic treatments for breast cancer. Sharon will be talking about her experience going through cryoablation and Paget's disease using Dr. Dennis Holmes. So, Sharon, would you like to speak? I didn't know if you were ready. Okay. Yes, it's up to you, all on you. Talk about your cryoablation. Talk about Dr. Holmes, you love him. Okay, March, 2018. I had a nipple discharge. So I went for an annual mammogram like everybody else would do. I was called back five days later because they saw a shadow and they said it was probably nothing, but they had me come in. I had a second mammogram and an ultrasound and the wonderful radiologist walks in and says, I'm not gonna candy coat this, you have cancer. And I'm right 95% of the time. So I know you have it. Hadn't even had a biopsy yet. I fa they fast tracked me to the next day to get a biopsy. And it turned out it was invasive ductal carcinoma, grade three, HER2 tumor, about 1.7 centimeters. A week later, they ran me into an MRI and off to see a surgeon. The first surgeon told me lumpectomy and radiation immediately. And, if that I, and when I told him I wanted to think about it, he said, no, you have to do it right away. If you don't do it right away, you'll need chemo as well. And the worst that's gonna happen is you'll get some radiation burns at the end. Well, he had just spent an hour talking to the guy in the room next to him about his golf game and his golf course and everything else and wasted all my time. So I couldn't even ask questions because I had another appointment. 
So that kind of uh, didn't do too much for my opinion of him. So I kind of left there feeling totally disrespected, threatened, and depressed. And then my neighbor across the street who was a retired nurse and who had two bouts of breast cancer and both times had mastectomies, she uh, talked me into going in the hospital support group because she said then I'd feel good about doing you know, what the doctors wanted. So I did. I went to the house, the, the support group. And to my horror, they were feeding the ladies candy. The entire table was covered with candy. They had Reese's peanut butter cups, Starburst, you know, the whole nine yards, Kirstie's kisses. I asked the lady next to me, do you realize that sugar feeds cancer? And she goes, yeah, I know. And she picked up some candy and ate it. Kind of really turned me off. And then the lady running the group was saying, you know, the best thing you can do, just do what the doctors say, hurry up and get it over with, get on with your life. And my reaction was, I'm not a friggin' Stepford wife. I'm, I'm, I knew right then and there, I wasn't doing it. So thanks to two friends that told me not to follow the doctor's opinion, I refused all the treatment and had my primary care doctor inform me that she wasn't looking forward to watching me die. So fortunately, one of my friends had been an oncology nurse for 10 years, and she decided not to do can't to do when she got breast cancer because her husband had died from what she thought was the treatment. She decided not to do it, the doctor said. Changed her diet, her lifestyle, supplements, the whole nine yards, quit on, and she's now cancer free. So she quit oncology because she said, you know, I can't make, I can't talk women into doing something I wouldn't do. So now she counsels with people instead. So that sent me on a research project and uh, my other friend that called me told me to look into black salve, which I did. And I did the whole black salve. I did every supplement I could find, red light therapy, low dose naltrexone, high dose melatonin, gumpy gumpy, black salve, asiatic tea, lymphatic massages. I threw everything but the kitchen sink at it for two and a half years. And then we moved here to Temecula and I found an integrative um, internist. So I started getting vitamin, 50 grams of vitamin C once a week, IV. IV ozone, chiropractic. And in the meantime, my nipple drainage was getting worse and nothing helped. It was scabby, crusty, painful, itchy, raw. It was just horrible, really annoying. I couldn't wear a seatbelt without holding it away from me. It was so bad. So I finally decided I wanted, oh, I saw a couple of doctors, you know, and they said, staph infection, you got eczema. Nobody could figure it out. But, you know, I did my research and I came to the conclusion I had Paget's disease. But I didn't really want to think that. So every time a doctor told me it wasn't that, I felt good, but I really knew it was that. So in 2020, I went wanted to do the RGCC test that was talked about earlier. So somebody in Pennsylvania told me about a doctor in Irvine, California, which is an hour and a half from me. And I managed to get to see her right away at the Cancer Center for Healing in Irvine with Dr. Keneally. She's um, pretty well known amongst all the holistic circles. And uh, I went up there to get the RGCC. And when I went back for my results, she said to me, you know, why don't you research cryoablation? She goes, look into that and see what you think. So I did. And I found two doctors that did it. A, one doctor in San Diego and Dr. Holmes. And I got in the cryoablation group on Facebook. And Jennifer Pinto just raved about Dr. Holmes and how I needed to go see him. And so I submitted my records to both of the doctors. Both of them accepted me but I ended up going to see Dr. Holmes. And my first visit with him, he took one look and he goes, you've got Pagets. If you don't, get, if that doesn't heal up in the next three months, you need to get a biopsy. So um, I already knew that. So anyways, I went home and a couple of days later, I'm doing my detox bath and I thought, forget this. I just need to get this nipple off. I can't deal with this anymore. So um, I emailed him and asked him if he could take that at the same time and he agreed. And so the day I went up for the, the, um, in the cryo, he put in, they put a rod in, it's real simple. It's a cryo tube, it's pretty skinny. I'm guessing maybe a 16th to an 18th of an inch diameter. And he freezes it for, I think it's about 10 minutes. And then it's about 10 minutes warming it up, takes the tube out. He removed the nipple, stitched it up put the tube, the cryo back in, froze the set. Oh, and the first time I, the, when I got there to do the cryo, <clears throat> he did an ultrasound and found a second tumor. And he wanted me to go to get an MRI, but I was so, the nipple was bothering me so much, I didn't want to wait anymore. So I just said, you know what, we just do this. 
And he was nice enough to go ahead and do it, even though he warned me that he may not get it all because it would be better to have an MRI, but I was fine with that. And uh, I kind of trusted his judgment. So we went ahead and did it. So I was there normal, longer than usual because of the nipple removal, but you know, when it was all done, I mean, it was so simple a procedure. It was not even as bad as a, the biopsy I had was way worse than that. And basically he put a Band-Aid on it. He put the dressing on the, the surgery from the nipple and I went home and made, drove home two hours and made dinner. It was pretty, you know, to me, it was pretty non-traumatic. And then about three months later, I did a follow-up ultrasound with him that showed no evidence of residual disease. At six months, which was last month, March 26, I had an ultrasound, an MRI with contrast and a biopsy. Scans were clear and biopsy came back benign, no malignancy. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. And I'll have to say, I know he's listening, but he's probably the most caring, compassionate doctor you'll ever meet. I don't trust doctors because I lost a daughter years ago to medical malpractice. And so I don't basically don't trust doctors, but I'm learning to trust him because, and that doesn't mean I don't question everything. He asked me, he told me to do radiation and I refused and he didn't argue with me, but he asked me to research anti hair 2 therapy since my tumors were HER2. And uh, I did, I did the research and I watched the, the uh, movie Living Proof that's about Dr. Slam and the doctor that, that developed Herceptin. And I went ahead and agreed, agreed to six months of Herceptin, which my last one was on Wednesday of last week. And um, that's pretty much my story. And now I'm just gonna stick with all my supplements and my IVC and my IV ozone going forward. And I will probably do the RGC blood biopsy um, circulating tumor cell in a couple of months to see what's happening with that. And just kind of go from there with Dr. Keneally and follow up with Dr. Holmes on my breast exams and ultrasound. Right. So that's pretty much my story. Thank you. Does anyone have a question that you don't like to ask about cryoablation or her experience? Yep, go ahead. Just unmute yourself and speak away. I have a question for Dr. Holmes. Why are more doctors not trained in this and are you training people so that it can be more available? There, we have to like um, mutate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, it, the process is underway. Okay. <laughs> not the mutation, but the training. <laughs> Good. Uh, Great story. You know, we've been we've been teaching people how to do cryoblation. I've been doing cryoblation for 18 years, and early on, I ran a fellowship program where I trained young surgeons to perform it. But there was really a need for there to be more trials that doctors could join to have a structure in which to participate in cryoblation offered to patients. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are a couple of trials that exist now, and one of those trials recently republished, re recently reported its result just two or three days ago, wow. that it was a successful 99%, 90% successful for tumors under two centimeters. So there is promise, but we have to have the data. Unfortunately, the data is coming forth. And because of this experience, this what has been a consistently positive experience with cryoblation and a lot of advocacy from women, uh, the American Society of Breast Surgeons has made a decision to open up a registry for cryoblation. A registry is basically a database so that any surgeon who has an interest in performing cryoblation has a way to participate and collaborate with other doctors to pool the data uh, and follow the outcomes. Uh, it, it eliminates the sentiment that the doctor, or the, the perspective that the doctor is sort of a, a loner out sort of experimenting on patients without the support of the community. It's actually a community effort that is supporting this. It hasn't launched yet, but the infrastructure is there and the commitment is there. So I think that will open the door to more surgeons around the country and radiologists performing cryoblation as part of this national community, not as loners. Excellent. I have a question for you, Dr. Holmes. Yes. Why is it that for breast cancer, you have to do all these trials. And from what I've read for all the other cancers, they didn't have to go through all this to get it approved. And the second question is, what can we do as women to fight it? Like write to the politicians, whatever. Is there some way we can fight for this? Well, I think, you know, the first answer, I'll start with the hardest one first. <laughs> uh, I think the challenge is a cultural one. 
And it's partly based upon the fact that we spent a hundred years doing, we spent a hundred years doing radical mastectomies, and then we found a way to treat it with a lot less harm by offering patients lumpectomy. And we we're finally in this lumpectomy era, and it seems to work. The question is, why give up something that seems to work for something that might not work? Now, we're in some ways we're still like we're still in a mastectomy area where we're doing something that might be more aggressive than need be, but you can understand how people are reluctant to to switch to something for which there's no long-term data and give up something for which the long-term data suggests it's working very well. And that's the lumpectomy radiotherapy approach. Uh, but, you know, these things take time. I've been at cryoablation, as I said, for 18 years. Yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it'd be nice if it could happen quicker, but it only happens because people are pressing. And so, at, you know, there are national organizations, there's the Komen Foundation, there are other organizations that are advocacy organizations that have a lot of, you know, influence. And I think it's important to reach out to them. Even the surgical societies need to hear from patients to know that this is something that they want. All of the things that we're doing now, as someone stated earlier, are things that we were forced to do because patients pushed us to change. That also applies to cryobation, but it's, you know, it, it, there's inertia. It takes, you know, a lot of force to move an iceberg. And so there okay. is this iceberg. Does Allison have a list of places we can write to and complain? <laughs> no, she, yeah. she does not have that list quite yet. <laughs> she has so many assignments. I'm not sure she has, has time. We, we'll have to talk about that one offline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm serious. I mean, I like you said, there's this, that. You know, it's all online, the surgical society, um, the radiation society, then the um, um, all the foundations, all the national foundations, you know, that's, it's a project. I mean, we, we need a nonprofit, all those of us that are on the forefront of advocating for, you know, this kind of thing. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. I'm well, sure I'm that surgeons, breast surgeons as a community, tend to be the most innovative and medical colleges and radiation colleges tend to be the most conservative, but we have to work with them. So right. in order for there to be movement, they also have to move with us because otherwise they'll keep, you know, pulling us back because they're concerned about the risk of recurrence and potential harm that we can do. And that conservatism is what slows the process. Oh yeah, I like my new oncologist you found for me, but she gave me the whole lecture on reoccurrence on Wednesday and it kind of turned me off of her again. <laughs> and I just told her, I said, I understand it's the standard of care, but I'm not going there. Okay. Not gonna think negative, I'm thinking positive. Okay. It's not coming back. Okay, thank you. I share <laughs> something. I wanna thank Dr. Holmes for answering. That was fantastic. Thank you for even being here. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question about cryoablation for I have, I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, this is Vicki. I'm going to see Dr. Holmes on the 26th. I can't wait. I'm going to do the cryoblation. Oh, I have oh, great. Yeah, ductal carcinoma in my left breast. But my uh, PCP wrote a letter to the insurance company, and I just got it today. We're going to fax it in. Um, we're trying to get them to pay for it. They've initially denied it, but. Um, I just want to read you a little bit of what she said, because she is fully on board with this. And she told me that she had procedure done on her breast and she wished she would have had cryoblation done. Um, but she said, a patient is currently working with Dr. Holmes in California, who has experienced and has done extensive studies on this procedure and its outcomes on invasive ductal breast cancer. Dr. Holmes is the only provider who is currently using this technique or is not the only provider who is using this technique to avoid the complications that can arise from mastectomies. Um, other places are Catering Cancer Center, MD Anderson, John Hopkins, Memorial Sloan, to name a few. This is not new. Um, there are many providers that are, are there, I'm sorry, it's that many providers are not familiar with procedure and we and they do not offer. Um, anyway, she says, it's my opinion that Mrs. Gale be given the opportunity to undergo this procedure. I've been counseled on the risks, the failures, the reoccurrences, 
I support Vicki Gale's decision to have this done. And I plead with you as her primary care provider that you change your decision to cover the procedure. Wow. So there, um, so there are people listening and I'm, I'm hopeful. So it would be good if we could get a, uh, get you to I'm post hoping. that letter so that other people can use that same letter with their yeah, doctors, the you know, yeah. share yeah. that letter on one of the sites, on one of the groups. Yeah, I'm also uh, appealing and fighting Medicare to try and get reimbursement for mine. And I found out they have five levels of appeal and I will go through every last one of them if I have to. That's fantastic. Because yeah. I think if I can get it approved at some point, then I will have more clout to help other people get it to the right. same thing. Awesome. Thank you. Because Medicare, of course, that's the standard for everything. Right. Any, yeah. any other questions? I'd like to chime in. Uh, yeah. Sharon, your, your uh, story and mine are kind of similar as I had that six centimeter um, lump that I went running to Dr. Holmes with and saying, I'm not doing a mastectomy and I'm not doing anything else. And I read this book that said, they're mine and I'm keeping them. Oh and yeah, it's a great book. It's yep. a great book. And yeah, Dr. Holmes was like, okay. <laughs> and um, he took me in 2018. It was February 13th. I'll never forget the day. And it was an all day procedure. He did seven freezings. I think you saw one of my breasts in one of his uh, seminars. But anyway, but I did, let me tell you, Sharon, I did have uh, lymph node involvement. And mm -hmm. I had told Dr. Holmes that I would have surgery. And then turned out he did the biopsy because I hadn't had a biopsy done since six years before, four years before. And it turned her two positive, just like yours. Wow. And so when I started the Herceptin, I did one round of Herceptin. I denied the chemo and everything else, but I did one round of Herceptin, the whole 10, I think 10 rounds. And the first round, the lymph node went away. I mean, it, they, the, the uh, CT scan said, you know, it was, I had had surgery and I hadn't. So it went totally away. And so we did nothing. So it's been over two years now. And I must say my lymph node involvement came back. Wow. And I went and saw Dr. Holmes two weeks ago because I wouldn't let anybody else touch him but me. He did a biopsy. And so I'm agreeing to him to let him surgically remove my lymph node. Okay. But he's the only doctor I trust with my life. So I, say, I feel the same. So I'll be seeing him in a couple of weeks to do that surgery. But he is the best, and I don't regret anything. And he saved my breast. So you guys, cryoblation. Yep. Yeah. That's good to know. The now, Dr. Holmes fan club. Yep. Oh, I, I think he's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm here to talk about because I also had cryoablation, but I had it done with Dr. Jason Williams in Mexico City. In fact, my friend Lisa G is on the the post, yeah, the Zoom with me, she came with me to Mexico City. What I wanna do right now is just share my screen so I could show you some images. Um, the first image you're gonna see is, well, the first thing is that Dr. Jason Williams obviously doesn't take insurance. I had to pay for it out of pocket, but what I like about, oh, what I liked about him is that after he does the cryoablation, he injects the area with immunotherapy drugs. So if you see what he wrote on mine, um, he um, injected it with something called Matrix M, Immuclamode, Celebrex, whatever they are, they're for immunotherapy. What I just wanted to say is before I went to Jason Williams and had cryoablation, um, what, oh, hang on, let me, let me pin myself. What I wound up is that first I had, a, um, I was told I had DCIS in the right breast and the left breast. First it was in the left, then they sent me for an MRI um, to get better pictures for my lumpectomy. I didn't know any better. And that's when the cancer, also, well, the pre-cancer DCIS on the right was found. What happened was, I get articles from all over the world now about cancer. 
And I was so mad because two weeks after my lumpectomy, I get an email from this um, company called the Ice Sense, uh, Ice Cure, which makes the machine for cryoablation. And it really came from Israel. They're touting their technology. And I read this, and I'm like, wow, if I would have had this a month ago, I wouldn't have had my lumpectomy. So I wound up doing research on it and calling the company just to find out about it. And I'm like, if my cancer ever comes back, that's what I'm doing. A year later, well, after my lumpectomy, the left stayed the way it is, the right, the tumor was looked at and, and it wound up being invasive. Even though I told my breast surgeon, we better take double the amount of margins because if I have to go in for another lumpectomy, it's not gonna be a good thing. So it came out clear, my margins were clear, but a year later, a, tumor, um, a small tumor was found, 1.2 centimeters. So right away, my breast surgeon sets me up. Your breast is prone to cancer. You have to get a lumpectomy. I said, no, I don't. I'm doing cryoablation. And it was funny because I'm running out of his office down the hallway screaming, bye, I'm doing cryoablation. And he's yelling at me, why are you trying to kill yourself? Cryoablation doesn't work. And I'm like, yes, it does, goodbye. But then I had to find the cryoablation doctor and do, uh, you can't do Google for that. And, and I actually thought, because when Israel sent me the article, I thought cryoablation was approved. I didn't know any difference. I made an appointment for this doctor in the city because she does cryoablation. When I got there, she's like, oh, you can't make the trial. I'm like, what trial? So I knew I had to find a doctor off cryoablation. I had trouble doing that. So I called the company and they sent me the name of Dr. Jason Williams. I wish they would have sent me Dennis Holmes, but they sent me Jason Williams, so it's all good. But it turns out I sent him my images, but I wanna make sure that people know because I have very dense breast tissue and it wasn't really the one, the, the tumor on the right was not found by mammogram or sonogram. It was only MRI, but the second MRI, not even the first MRI, so when I heard that the, um, that the procedure is done by sonogram and I spoke to Jason Williams, I'm like, uh-oh, you're never going to be able to see it. So I'm not going to Mexico City and then coming home without the procedure done. And he said to me, no, no, no. If you had um, a clip placed, I'll be able to see it. But to ease my fear, he sent a script to my mammogram place and he made them do the sonogram again, focusing on that area. And then I sent him the images and Dr. Williams says, yep, I could see your clip come down. So I went with my friend, Lisa. Now it's different the way Dr. Williams does it is that normally like the way Dr. Holmes does it, it's in his office and it's a 30 minute procedure, maybe a 40 minute procedure and you're done. But the way Dr. Williams does it is he claims he gets better outcome if the patient is asleep and he doesn't, and the patient doesn't move. So let me share my screen because I have images. This is the hospital that he, I had to go to Mexico City because um, even though he's an American and he is licensed in the United States, because he does cryoablation off FDA protocol and he injects um, immunotherapy drugs afterwards, he can't do it in the United States. So I had to go to Mexico City, that's the hospital. Oh, that's me in the hospital. One thing you should know about the, this Mexico City hospital, so clean, you could eat off the floor. I couldn't believe it. Everything is sanitized and they have a little thing over it saying this was sanitized. Oh, okay, that's me. Um, Dr. Williams does the cryoablation, but it's on a MRI table. I guess he doesn't, well, he does an MRI first to get better pictures, and then he does everything else by sonogram. That's Dr. Williams on the left. Um, okay, that's, he's um, numbing my breast, even though I was asleep. But then you could see that's the cryoablation probe about to go into my breast. 
it's really, the cryoplasian probe is really thin and it has nitrogen oxide in it. It gets to be negative 170 degrees and it freezes the tumor. It surrounds the tumor with an ice ball, it freezes it. It, it breaks up into little shards and your immune system takes it away. That's Dr. Williams. That's another me on the table. That's my breast on the table. You could see the tumor in the, in the sonogram. And that's me at the end. Oh yeah, that's my dinner. Oh yeah, that's me and Dr. Williams. And that's, oh, my friend Lisa that came with me. And um, anyway, yeah, let me stop my, stop my, my screen. What I wanted to say also is that um, I do know for a fact that cryoablation works because what happened was, I guess my breast is prone to cancer. I really don't know because when I came back, I had the mammogram and sonogram and the MRI and everything looked good. But then 14 months later, my right breast started hurting me again. I, I, there's a little certain ping I get in my breast and I know I have cancer. So I went back to my former breast surgeon who still, you know, keeps up with me by the way. And I said to him, look, I need another MRI. My breast is hurting me. So I'm not, 14 months after my cryo ablation, another DCS was found. It has no relation to the, the DCIS that I had cryo ablated. Oh, by the way, when I spoke to Dr. Williams, because after my lumpectomy and a year later, the DCIS was found again. And he thinks that it was because during my biopsy, a single cell escaped, wasn't caught in the lumpectomy scoop and started a new tumor. But then 14 months after my cryoablation, a brand new DCIS was found. And because I didn't have enough money, you know, to do it again, because Williams is expensive, I figured, let me do another, you know, lumpectomy. Now, the breast surgeon said to me, you know, he's telling me the whole time, oh, cryoablation doesn't work. So when he went into the lumpectomy, he said to me, well, I'm going to go in and take out the area that you had cryoablated to look for cancer and also to take out the, the marker. Well, it turns out the pathology came back that there was no cancer. Everything was ablated. So I do know that cryoablation works. Oh, the one, uh, one more thing I wanted to show you. I'm sorry, I didn't go to the very end of my screen share. This picture to me is an important picture because what happened is that um, doc, you know, Dr. Williams wanted me to do it with anesthesia, which I did. And in Mexico City, you, I, there is no uh, pre-op room. You have to pay for a room for 24 hours. So my friend and I thought, well, if you're paying for the room for 24 hours, you might as well stay overnight. So the next, I got the cryoablation done at noon. The next day at noon, I was discharged. Lisa comes, my friend comes to pick me up and she says, how are you feeling? I, you need to rest or how are you feeling? I said, no, I feel great. She's like, okay, let's go sightseeing. So I got released after cryoablation at noon. At 1.30, I'm back at the hotel. At three o'clock, we're at the Mexico City Zoo running around. And at five o'clock, I had this picture taken in the butterfly um, area. So it just goes to show you that it's so much better with cryoablation and not a lumpectomy. When I had a lumpectomy, the next day or two, I wasn't running around, I felt sick. I couldn't lift anything heavy. Um, I still had, I, in fact, to this day, I still have pain from the lumpectomy area. Cryoablation, no scar, no nothing. A day later, I'm running around. Jill, can I add something? Yes. So technically you'll have to do a, a, a study to make sure there was no confounding factors of sightseeing affecting the results of cryoablation. True, yeah, that's <laughs> funny because you know, when people, and then I'm gonna stop and we'll move ahead. But when people get a lumpectomy, let's say, I'm not even gonna say mastectomy because we're talking about DCIS here. But when people get a lumpectomy, 
they're not running around the next day. They're taking it easy. Then I swear to you, 24 hours later, I'm running around Mexico City. And then that night we had a, a, a fancy dinner. I mean, you're not eating, you're not running around. So I say cryoablation, if you could do it, do it. I, I, I saw no pain. I drove home two hours after my procedure, okay. made dinner, went to bed, got up the next day, went, got my IVC and did everything I normally did. Like nothing yeah. happened. And that's I even had a minor surgery and had the nipple removed too. And I was still like back right. to normal. Well, that's why I say cryoablation is the lunch hour, you know, procedure. Because normally, don't go by me with the anesthesia, but it's done in a half, like you go for your lunch break. You go get it done in a half an hour, you go back to work, no pain, no nothing. The only thing you need is a gauze pad to, you know, a little, uh, you know, a little Band-Aid. That's it, nothing. Awesome. So if anyone has any questions for me about it, you know, feel free to ask me. What I was gonna do afterwards, if you wanna stick around is, um. I have a video on cryoablation. So if you wanted to watch that, you can. Okay, so now the next person I wanna bring up is um, Kawana Rucka. She is a two-time breast cancer thriver. She is certified a certified holistic cancer coach at Rucka Wellness and Dr. Sam MD. Kawana's passion is empowering women to advocate for themselves along the breast cancer journey. Kawana will be sharing her experience on oncological hypothermia. And this is something I'm really interested about. So Kawana. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, that's my story. So in 2018, yeah, uh, um, I don't see you front and center. Oh, you don't see me? I'm somewhere. Can you see me around? Cause... No, I want to, um, okay, you know, let me um, pin you. Okay. Oh, no, hang on one second. Let me, um, yeah, no, I don't, give me one second. You know, I don't see you front and side. Okay. okay, give me one second. Um, oh, okay, I don't know. Okay, yep, go ahead. Okay. So okay, go ahead. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2018 um, with stage one um, uh, triple positive breast cancer. So I was HER2 positive. Um, I felt a lump in my breast and I, um, I always check my breast because my mother had fibrocystic breasts. And so she taught me as a little girl to check my breast. And so I checked my breast, I felt this lump and I was, um, went to the bedroom. I said to my husband, I feel a lump. And he checked it and he said, yeah, that lump was definitely not, not there before. Um, Cause I encourage women to teach your husband how to check lumps, not just for them, us, but for themselves because men can also get breast cancer. Right. Um, and so I immediately contacted my um, gynecologist. I was 37 years old. I had no, you know, no one in my family had ever had breast cancer. Even though my mom had had a uh, cyst removed, she had never had cancer. Um, so I went in, she checked my breast and she said, oh yeah, that definitely feels like a lump. She's like, but you know, it, it's not solid. So I don't know that that's, you know, really a cancerous tumor, but we're going to send you over to get a mammogram. So I ended up going to get the mammogram. Um, they did the mammogram and I'm like, uh, something looks a little suspicious, but we're not really sure. And so did the mammogram. They said, well, we want you to come back and do the biopsy. So did the biopsy and I was like, oh, well, we found a, 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 we found an area in the left breast and two in the right breast that we want to look at. And, um, you know, so I was, I was clueless, really. I was like, oh, okay, biopsy, whatever. Um, so after the biopsy, they called, she said, we have good news, we have bad news. And I said, okay, she said, the good news is that that large lump that you felt in your breast is benign. The bad news is that we see a small calcification in the lower quadrant of the right breast and it's cancerous. And so I was like, okay. So within, you know, I immediately was like, okay, I, I knew, you know, I was like, okay, what do you, what do you feel like my, you know, treatment would be? And she said, well, probably Herceptin and a lumpectomy and radiation. And I was just like, well, that's a whole lot. And my, it was very small, it was 0.75. 
uh, millimeters. Um, so it was, you know, barely one centimeter in size. And I was just like, okay, well, I said, well, I'm going to start looking up holistic doctors too, because if I do have to do these other things, I just want to be able to be supported along the journey because I just, just didn't know, you know, if I do chemo, if I had to do Herceptin, if I had to do all these things, I wanted my immune system to be strong. So I immediately contacted a naturopathic doctor here who specialized in, in, in um, cancer care. And I started going through analysis with him. He started kind of telling me some of the things that were, you know, wrong with me. Like I had very low vitamin D levels. I had very low iron levels. Um, you know, some of those things and some of these things, if you go and research, you now know that a lot of these things can be are, are they can call, they can be a part of the cancer process. A lot of women with uh, breast cancer do have a low, low vitamin D levels. A lot of us do have low iron levels. And so he started boosting me up. Um, and so after talking to my physician, he's like, you know, Quana, I think you should just have a lumpectomy and do radiation. We'll do Herceptin for two years. And you go on about your life. And so the more and more I started reading about her septin and, you know, I, he was like, you'll have to go through, uh, get testing to see about your heart because it, you know, it could be bad on the heart and all these things. I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay. So I had the lumpectomy, had it removed, started on a holistic path. Um, and then uh, about almost two years later, I went in for my routine mammogram and they found another suspicious area came back and it ended up being another small tumor, like so close to where the original site was. It was the exact same cancer. And so I didn't really freak out about it because I was like, all right, so that just means I need to go harder this time. Like I need to, you know, really get, so I talked, saw this, saw this woman on Facebook who went to a doctor in Spain. His name is Dr. Hilu, Raymond Hilu. And um, she went to him, she was a stage four ovarian cancer patient and she went to him and he healed her cancer in 90 days and so I said how do I find this man so I contacted him I did blood work I sent my blood work in he sent me on a sent me a, a, a protocol back he said have your you know just whatever you got to do decide to have the surgery get the tumor out and then after that I want you to come to Spain for treatment so I had surgery December 31st of 2019 I brought in 2020 cancer-free. Um, and I started my protocol with Dr. Hilu, and then uh, the end of February of 2020, I flew to Spain to his clinic to do hypothermia. So I am going to show you what hypothermia looks like. So I'll see if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, but we don't see any image for right now. I don't see any images. Okay. No. Can you do you see it, anything now? No. It says uh, that you shot it, started your, share, your screen share, but you didn't click on the, the image that you need to. Huh. Stop. Um, hang on. Now we don't see you. Yeah, no, you turned your video off, I think. Okay, but you have to click on the on the program or app or whatever that you want to start using to share your screen. Yep. No, Kamana. Hello. we've lost her yeah i think we lost yeah okay and i don't know why i'm not seeing anybody else Maybe okay yeah out a bit by, by accident let's see if she's still in here all right i'm gonna have to um hang on a minute yeah, she might be yeah. trying to get back in i don't know right well, she's still in but what happened Yes. Right. Yeah, we don't see you or any of your screen. Can't hear you. You're on mute. She's on mute. I see. Right. You. Right. You're on mute. I'm asking her to unmute herself. And Just when she got to the good part. 
And then I went to Spain, yeah. had hypothermia. Let me show you the picture. <laughs> We're all like sitting on the edge of our seat. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Yeah. Right, but we don't still see your screen. You left us hanging. Uh, you know what? It, Zoom froze up on me, so I couldn't. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, it froze up on me and I couldn't get to anything. All right, so I can't show you the screen. It okay, sorry about that. that. But just explain what hypothermia yeah. is. So hypothermia is where they actually um, take radio frequency. So, so there is a there's a, so there hypothermia can be done several ways. So a lot of the clinics in Mexico do full body full body hypothermia, where they put you in a a a, a really big bed and there's infrared lights in it, and they take you up and it increases the temperature of the body and you sweat. And it, it causes you to have a fever. And of course, they say when, when the body um, is going into that fever state, then it's killing, uh, you know, it's detoxing, but it also, it can, it can kill cancer cells. It causes mm -hmm. apoptosis. Um, but then there's also what they call deep oncological hypothermia, which is what I had. So it's different. There's, a, there's actually an institute here in, in California called Hypothermia Institute, and I encourage all of you to look them up and contact them. But they do hypothermia, and they do hypothermia alongside of chemo and radiation because it also helps with the efficacy of chemo and radiation. And they also do hypothermia alone, and they get very good um, results. They use an ultrasound machine to heat up the tumor and kill the cells. So um, that's also another option for you. So the one that I did was deep oncological hypothermia. This, um, this, this is only done in mainly the European countries. So it's standard of care in Germany, Switzerland, and I think um, Japan. And Japan and one other <laughs> Asian country uses it. And so what it looks like is there's two plates that they put on the area of where the tumor is they turn it on, it's like a big radio frequency machine and there's radio frequencies that go in to the site of the tumor and it ablates it over time. And so I did, you do that like, and the thing about it is it was non-toxic. Um, I didn't have to like be under any type of uh, anesthesia. I just went there, they um, heated up the breast and the plates are cold actually, and you're not supposed to feel anything. So they feel like cold plates, but there's radio frequencies coming in from the machine directly into the tumor site. Now in Europe, some yeah, people- sir, use, come on. Some people use this hypothermia alongside of chemo and radiation and some do it alone. Um, they use it on the brain. They can use it on all different types and parts of the body. Um, so I did that every day for two weeks. And then I also did the full body hypothermia in which I was, um, they heated me up into a fever. I mean, hot lights is like being in the hottest sauna. You could be in 140 to 160 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. You're in there for an hour. They take you out of it. They put you in something that looks almost like a body bag and you lay there for another hour until your temperature raises above 100 degrees. And then once that's done, they take you out. They pump fluids in you um, and they put a thermometer up your rectum <laughs> to, oh, okay. to test you and check you. Um, and then you're done and you're, and you're done sweating. And what I will tell you is this. The beauty in me going there and doing the treatments I did, because it wasn't just hypothermia, it wasn't just that. I did ozone therapy, I did high dose vitamin C, I did foot detoxes. I'm also a mistletoe therapy patient. Um, I also did what he has, it's called biocollectic oxygen, where you breathe nothing but fresh air in, uh, with a panine extract that was amazing. But every day that I was there, I started to feel better and better and better and better. And by the time I left, I felt amazing. And the thing that I can tell you is that I have fibrocystic breasts. And so when I went, I had one fibroid that's in the left breast that was about two centimeters um, in size. And by the time I left, it was 0.5 centimeters at the end of that two-week treatment. Wow. So I figure if it's shrinking that, 
if there's any residual cancer cells left after I've had this surgery, I think we probably went straight there, right, with the things that we've done. I also did PEMF, which is pulse electromagnetic fields, where you put you on a machine, they send the pan, they use pan -pimi, they put two, a big, uh, two big tubes on you, and they send electrical pulses to um, areas in the body, which is known to uh, kill cancer cells. Um, and in the U.S., they have places to do PEMF. It's not the same as that one. Um, but it's in Europe, they use the pan -pimi machine, and that's the one I use. And Dr. Helu, um, you can go to his, his um, site, it's clinichiluinstitute.com. But his success rate right now, and he is not a, he's a cellular biologist, um, but his success rate right now is about 80 to 85% success rate. And he gets people with all types of unknown diseases People, when they have no hope left, have gone to Dr. Hilo and he's had amazing, amazing results. So what I can say is I went through all those treatments and when I got back, he recommended that I do mistletoe therapy. And I don't know if you all know of mistletoe, um, but I've been in the, so mistletoe is in clinical trial with John Hopkins Hospital through believebig.org. And if you all don't know, that's uh, Dr. Nasha Winters. And I know many of you have probably read her book. She's a part of that trial, um, along with Dr. West others. Um, I've been doing mistletoe for ever since I got back. So about seven to eight months I've been on mistletoe. So that's my protocol. I haven't done Herceptin or chemo or radiation, but I can tell you that my last two thermograms and ultrasounds have proven that I am cancer free. Um, I am also doing blood work um, following up now. That's why I told you all I'm doing the biocept test. I'm doing carrots. Um, to look at some of the biomolecular uh, cell biology on, you know, my cancer cells. Um, so now what I do with uh, Dr. With Dr. Helu is every 90 days, I prick my finger and send my blood to him. He sends me back a protocol and tells me what's going right and what's going wrong in my body. And what I can say is that he's spot on. Um, because when I went in, the doctors were like, you know what, we're going to have to do a full CT MRI scan to tell you if cancer is outside of that area. And um, Dr. Hilo said it's not. It's only in that one spot. And he knew that because he could see it from the blood test. And when they were done, I went to see my surgical oncologist. I said, yeah. And I said, he also told me that I have a small cyst on my liver. And when she came back with the CT scan, she said, you have a really small cyst on your liver. She said, how did you know that? I said, Dr. Helu told me that in my result. So Dr. Helu also treated me for my, my liver cyst there. So we did pampini on that and um, hypothermia as well. So that was the treatment I've done. Um, and here I am, it's been almost what, three years and two, three, four months. Um, and I feel great. Um, for me, it was about, I feel like I came to this part of my life that I wanted quality over quantity and that's up to everybody, however you choose. Um, but I just didn't, I wanted to, I didn't want to just survive. I wanted to be able to thrive and live a, a, a healthy life for however long it is. Um, and I can't say that I do have an amazing oncologist who understands mistletoe. She's a part of lots of integrative trials and things, and she's very open-minded. So she um, is on board with the things I do. So she doesn't mind doing my testing and she doesn't mind, uh, you know, the things I've done. But however, had I known about cryoablation before, I would have done cryoablation, I would have done hypothermia, and I would have done mistletoe. That would have been my protocol. Um, and if cancer comes back, I'm going to Dr. Holmes. So that's just, that's my story. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, to ask. Kwana, did you have to pay cash for all that? I did, of course, yes, because none of it. Now, what I want you to know is, if you go to, the funny thing is, if you go to um, American Cancer Society site, it tells you all about hypothermia. And there are actually hospitals that do hypothermia along with radiation, but it has to be done together. They won't do it separate. So when I was trying to get it, so I appealed because I told them I did hypothermia. They gave me all the codes, so I went through the second level pill, now I'm in a third level pill because hypothermia is actually done 
for other types of cancers like breast, like grain cancer. Um, there's a couple other that it's already proven to be done and they don't do it. Sometimes they do it with radiation, but sometimes they do it standalone. So um, I will say that if you contact the Hypothermia Institute, he has codes and he will fight for you to help you get those, um, that treatment done uh, through, through um, them through insurance because I talked to them before I actually went to Spain. Um, but I ended up going to Spain because I was already on the protocol. That's the interesting so. thing about Medicare. They have a billing code for cryoablation, but it's interesting when you read it, it says next to it, Mac-based price. Right. The insurance companies can decide what they're willing to pay. Yep. So it'll be interesting to see if I win my appeal and what they actually pay. Because if they have, if they say that it's covered and it's Mac-based, then they should pay something. Right. So I get my vitamin C and my ozone for free through Medicare because I found doctors that would actually bill them. Oh, wow. Where is that, Sharon? In Temecula. That Temecula oh, that's awesome. Integrative Medicine. I get massage twice a week, chiropractic once yeah, a week, okay. IV ozone one day, and an oh. IVC another day, and all of it. I don't pay for any of it with my Medicare. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Well, you might have to share those resources. I wanted to ask Kawana if you tracked your, um, your costs that you spent out of pocket. Cause I have a friend who was also doing a lot of integrative things and, you know, she was keeping track of the costs and, mm -hmm. you know, because I, it's really, that's something that we could advocate for also because it's, a, it's a, um, discriminates people that, that don't have yeah. the, the means. Yeah. And yeah, I do track my costs and I write it off on my insurance as well. I mean, that's the other option you always have at the end of, you know, your medical bills. And it did help, us, it has helped us out for the last two years because it has definitely added up for sure. Um, and then some of the things that, you know, I, I've gotten around on supplements and things, a lot of those I use um, HSA and FSA because you can on some of those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, things like high dose vitamin C, ozone, um, mistletoe. Mistletoe cost me about two hundred dollars a month um, out of pocket, but it's getting ready to go to stage two clinical trials. So hopefully, you know, in the next year or so, it'll be standard of care because outside of the U.S., it is um, in co co countries like Germany and Switzerland, you can get mistletoe prescribed. So, yep. I actually put everything on my income taxes because I keep my office notes every time I go to Dr. Keneally because on the office notes, it lists all the supplements as being prescribed. So, hey, yep. it's a prescription, right? Yep. I, I'm not an accountant, but I think it's somewhere in the 12,000 or, I mean, 12% range of whatever you earned income. If you um, have more than 12% of medical expenses, you can deduct it. And Correct. I'm not sure the exact number, but it's somewhat probably close to that. Yep. Seven and a half percent. How much? Seven and a half percent. Seven and a half. Yeah. Oh, I think it went up. Five I think it went up higher. Exact. Anyway. Yeah. Throw that. Well, I, I'm on Medicare. I mean, I'm on Social Security, so we have very low income anyway. So it works out great. Right. Wow. Nice. Right. Well, I want to thank you for speaking, Kuana, because that was interesting. I knew nothing about it. So yeah, I, I want to thank you for even enlightening us. Yeah, and I think if you read, I think in Jane's book, she talks about hypothermia. Um, <laughs> Jane McCullough's book, How to Start yeah. Cancer. Um, she talks about it in there, but you can also go to Dr. Helu's uh, website and you will see, um, and his clinic is amazing. It's very, it was great care. It was, I don't regret it at all. Um, it was an amazing experience. It's in beautiful Marbella, Spain, Southern Spain. So, um, but uh, it was uh, the one of the best experiences I could have ever had. It was so different from any kind of care I've ever received in the United States. Great. Kawana, can you tell us again the place in California that does the hypothermia and also yes. what your dose of mistletoe is? I'm curious of that. Um, so I will give you hypothermia. I'm going to put this in the um, blog. It's Hypothermia Institute. And I believe they're in Santa Monica. To, um, I can't spell it almost 11 what's 11 o'clock yeah but it's hypothermia institute and so for mistletoe I am on um mistletoe I'm on Iscador M I mean yeah Iscador Molly M which comes from the apple tree um and my dose so 
mine go, you know, my box code one to 20. And so my reaction is at the 10. Um, but I still, I, the way that I, the way that I, I I'm, I'm under Dr. Nash's protocol, um, I still use all that's in the box, but the 10 and the 20 is where the majority of my reaction is. Um, and then each, and then I go up. So I was on the M, like M1 series. Now I'm on the M2 series. And then I'll, you know, you continue as long as you, until you have re reactions. So that's the way my protocol is right now. And I don't know anything about it yet, but my doctor's willing to prescribe it. So is there a book on that or whose protocol are you following? So you, so there's a, several doctors that have been trained by Dr. Nasha Winter. She's what, so what I would tell you is go to believebig.org. Okay. Go to believebig.org because they are the ones who are funding the clinical trials of John Hopkins. And they're the people that are, they are the, they are the certifi certifying organization that is working with physicians to be certified in the U.S. You contact them. Most of them have all been trained the same way in how they do their protocol. So my uh, naturopathic oncologist is Dr. Kirsten West, who works directly under Dr. Winters. Okay. Dr. Okay. Keneally in Irvine at the Cancer Center also does mistletoe. Oh, wow. Good to know. She does all the integrative stuff. It's amazing. Take a look at her website, Cancer Healing for... All right. Cancercenterforhealing.com. Kuana, do you also do all of Dr. Winter's uh, blood work, that panel? I do, I do. So my, my naturopathic oncologist does the blood work panel for me every uh, 90 days. And then I also do my blood work panel with Dr. Hebu every 90 days. And so it's always amazing because the two, um, so his is a cellular biologist view so he can see different things like he can say I see this in the blood I see that in the blood but I will tell you that those blood tests come back very similar because recently um he said I need you to up your zinc she said I need you to up your zinc um he said your cancer markers are decreasing your cells are uh more moving more freely and when I looked at my cancer marker test they were let down. He said, your inflammation is 100% better than it was a year ago. My IGF-1 was really, really low on my testing. So the two, they work well together. They speak to each other. Thank you. Yeah, I met Dr. Winters in 2016 at uh, the Radical Remission with Dr. Kelly Turner. I did a workshop at the Omega Institute with them, and I love Dr. Uh, Nasha. Yeah, so thank okay. you. And so I'm actually going, I'm putting together, um, uh, there's a doctor in India, Dr. Zubin. So if you all are on Facebook, if you join the mistletoe therapy group, um, Dr. Zubin is in there and he's been doing mistletoe for over 30 years in India, but he also um, worked uh, here at John Hopkins and MD Anderson and a couple other, and he was on uh, the cancer tutor recently talking about mistletoe. He's a specialist in mistletoe. And if you join that group, he asks, he answers questions and things, but I'm going to be doing um, some, we're, we're putting together a program soon. So in June, I'm gonna be doing a program on mistletoe therapy and I'm gonna invite you all to it. What group, what do we, go, what do we, Facebook just put mistletoe therapy group? Yep, it's the mistletoe therapy group. Okay. Is it the only one then? It's, it's, yeah, it's only one of them that I, that's in there. Yep. So you should, hold on, let me get there. It's, oh, it's mistletoe cancer therapy, mistletoe cancer therapy. And it says group by Enlifen, E-N-L-I-F-E-N. -E that is Dr. Zubin's organization. And he is amazing. He knows mistletoe. He's treated thousands of people with mistletoe, all different types. And he's always in there giving great uh, advice for those who want to know more. You said E L I F E N. Mm -hmm. E N L I F E N, and the group is called Mistletoe Cancer Therapy. Okay. You got it. I'm putting in the chat too. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Any other questions? This is Duana. I have a question. Sure. Yes. Go ahead. So 
how, you know, so all of these great things that I hear you all talking about are really not available in my area. And I can certainly travel, but obviously it wouldn't make sense, I don't think, to travel somewhere monthly for mistletoe and those types of things. But how, you know, there's so much information out there and there's so many um, therapies and all of those. And if you've kind of talked about this and I've missed it, I'm really sorry, but how do you really start drilling down into, you know, what works best, you know, or where do I, you know, where do you start? Like I, it's just hard to kind of go through all the mountains of information and kind of come up with, you know, I, I don't have doctors in my area. I, there is a naturopath that I work with, but, you know, I believe she's got, she has some limitations. She's a great doctor, but there's some limitations there. So how do you kind of find somebody? Obviously, it would have to be done remotely. How do you kind of start to determine protocols and those types of things? So for me, Dewana, uh, I would my suggestion would be to find. So with with um, I know several naturopathic oncologists now that are doing virtual consultations. Um, Dr. Sam is one that I know, and she's great. Um, and Dr. Sam uh, actually. Uh, in turn with Dr. Diamo, who does the blood type diet, and she's got, I mean, she knows, she knows protocols that are effective, you know, so you don't have to go through the mess. And she starts with the RGCC testing to kind of get you to what protocols will really work for you. And then she designs around that. And so that would be my first suggestion is to find a telehealth naturopathic oncologist who really specializes in this and can come up with a protocol for you because there is a lot um, to, to surf through and you don't want, there's a lot of naturopathic doctors out here, but they're not oncology certified. So right. they might not be giving you the true protocols for you know cancer. Um, so that would be my first step. And if you go to believebig.org, which I was telling you about with mistletoe, um, if you click on their physician's link, there are a ton of um, integrative oncologists on there that do virtual consultations that you could sign up with. Dr. What's Camille, the name of that site again? Believebig.org. I'll put it in here. Okay, Dr. thank you. It's hard to hear sometimes. Sorry. And the good thing about Believe Big is if you sign up with them from one of their naturopathic oncologists, they give scholarships for um, for um, for a consultation with a, a mistletoe doctor, and they will give you a, a two hundred and fifty dollars scholarship for mistletoe. Okay. Yeah, it's just you know I'm kind of like um, most of you. You know, I all of the things that I've done since the you know quote unquote diagnosis in 2016 um, have been outside of traditional medicine. So it's been out of pocket and I've spent a ton of money and, you know, I'm willing to continue to spend my own money because I believe in not doing the things that we're asked to do, but I would like to find something that's specific for me. So I'm just not shooting in the dark, right? Because you could do, you know, do things all day long and spend tons of money and still not be addressing your needs. So I really like the idea of finding somebody that could help me drill down and develop a protocol that meets uh, my particular situation. Dr. Keneally in Irvine at the Cancer Center for Healing does it as well. Um, the one thing good about her is if you have a PPO insurance, it, she takes PPO insurance for her office visits and for a lot of things not for the RGCC, obviously, but for any normal blood tests or for um, her office visits and that kind of thing, she does take insurance. Okay, great, thank you. And she's the cancercenterforhealing.com. I think I've, I've, I think I've heard her present a couple of times on some webinars. You probably have, she's been on Cancer Tutors, she's been on Square One, and she was on The Truth About Cancer this past weekend. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. Juana, what was the name of the clinic in Spain? Oh, come on. Yeah, we don't come on, you're you're muted. Wait, hang on one second. Oh, uh, here we go. Yes. Let me put the link in um the messenger so you guys can have it. 
Thank you. You're welcome. I just wanted to mention, Donna, um, there's another really good resource. Um, I think he's in Oregon, Donnie Yance. And he has a clinic called the Madiri Clinic. And he wrote a book called Herbal Healing um, and Cancer. So he's like an herbalist and he's got protocols that deal more with herbs and, and um, supplements and diet and things like that, as well as spiritual. So I, I really like him a lot. And um, so if anybody wants to check him out, uh, Donnie, uh, yes. Can you repent or spell that? I live in Oregon, so. Yeah. Uh, his last name is Yance, Y-A-N-C-E. Donnie is his first name. And um, I loved his book um, on herbal healing and cancer. He's written several books, but he's like a true herbalist. So he, he uses a lot of herbs. And, and what's the name of his clinic, you said? Uh, Adiri, M-E-D-E-I-R-I. M-E-D. He's got, uh, yeah, he's got um, people that also probably would do virtual calls at this point. Madiri, okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, before we go, if you don't mind, if you want to stick around for a couple of minutes, I have a short video on cryoablation I'd like to show you, if you don't mind. Um, let me, oh, hang on a second. Let me get to the one I wanted to show you. Uh, okay. Okay, yep, yeah, this is it. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us on News Channel 3 Live at 9 on this Friday. A landmark clinical trial in the United States could change how doctors treat breast cancer from the inside out. It's called cryoblation therapy, and one Mid-South doctor at the West Cancer Clinic is working to bring that treatment into the mainstream. Here to explain how it works, what it is, and most important, what it means for breast cancer patients is Dr. Richard Fine. He joins us live via Zoom. Dr. Fine, thank you so much. This sounds very interesting and exciting for breast cancer patients and their families. What is cryoablation? How does it work? Well, cryoablation is a technique for actually destroying the breast tumor by actually freezing it from the inside out, as you said. Um, it can be done very quickly, very safely, and essentially painless. Um, the system uses what is called a cryoprobe, which is a hollow needle that is inserted into the tumor after numbing the patient's breast with local anesthetic. The temperature with liquid nitrogen is brought down to a very low level. And then for about 20 or 30 minutes, the tumor is frozen. It kills the tumor, but does not destroy any surrounding tissue. Wow. And once that is accomplished, the cryoprobe is removed. The patient is able to go home uh, with their breast intact. Wow. So it, it sounds pretty similar to the, and I'm, I'm going to use the wrong term because I'm not a medical person, but the very targeted radiation that really focuses on targeting just the tumor. But is the difference that the side effects, I mean, we all, we all know about the side effects of radiation. Are the side effects less with this? What's the advantage? Yeah, this is a very well tolerated procedure. There's very little, if any, side effect. Patients are going home, like I said, with their breast intact, with pretty much immediate recovery, able to resume normal activity, and uh, very limited time away from their work, their family, or home. And there's no fear, obviously, of toxicity of radiation, where, let's face it, though it is a, a treatment that's long used, and I, I'm not advocating against it, it, there is some tox fear of toxicity in any case, is that correct? That's correct, but let me make sure that we make one thing clear. The use of the cryoablation is really the replacement of the surgical removal of the tumor from the breast. Okay. If patients have the need for radiation or for chemotherapy or endocrine therapy, other therapies that would normally be recommended even when the tumor is removed, 
they may still need those treatments in addition to the cryoablation. Okay, this is just a better way to get the tumor out. So would it be most appropriate for patients who catch the, uh, a tumor very, very early before it's had a chance to spread at all? Well, we're looking for small tumors, but we're also looking for tumors with very favorable biology. In other words, tumors that are hormone receptor positive and what we call HER2 negative, tumors that have a very good prognosis to begin with. And these small tumors that are stage one, early stage, that have favorable biologic features are the ideal patients to have this procedure. Okay, where are you in the clinical trial? Um, how, how close might this be to actually becoming a reality in a widespread way? Well, it has already been approved in several countries around the world for use with breast cancer. Uh, we've been using cryoablation in lots of other cancers in the United States, and we're getting very close. The ICE-3 trial has finished accruing over 200 patients. Many of those patients are, have reached their five-year follow-up level, and it's showing very excellent results. The first interim results that we discussed at the American Society of Breast Surgeons in May of 2018 looked at the first 156 patients treated, and there was only one recurrence, which is very similar and equivalent to surgical removal or breast conservation therapy. Wow, that's got to be exciting for you. It sounds like it would also save a tremendous amount of money because there would be no need for reconstruction of the breast, I would think. Yes, the breast may, remains intact. There's no breast reconstruction. There's also no anesthesia, no operating room charges. This is an office-based procedure done under local anesthetic. Wow. So I'm curious, we hear so much in the media about breast cancer. I realize it is not the most prevalent breast cancer, so maybe it just gets more press. But why is it that it's, it's been used for other cancers but not breast until now? I'm just curious. I, I think it's more because the um, clinical trials just need to be done um, in a very safe way to be able to prove that it is effective and that it's safe for patients. And I think that some of the other um, trials have been maybe done before the breast cancer trials. Gotcha. So it's just a practical reason. Thank you so much. I am sure you guys at the West Clinic are super excited about this, as, uh, as everyone should be. Have a blessed day. I want to thank everyone for coming, and have a good night. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye.